Welcome to the Metasploit Sprint demo meeting for October 31st, 2017. Uh, October 31st means this is the Halloween edition of the Metasploit demo meeting. Very spooky. Um, also have this uh, character here. Let's see if this. There you go. <laughs> so, well, that guy's pretty cool. All right. I heard you did some Halloween pumpkin carving last night. Perhaps. Oh, we'll talk. Well, there, there'll be a, there's, there's a little there's a picture of part of that uh, further on in the slide deck. But yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so, do what? Way to steal thunder. Way to steal thunder. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, organizational stuff. So we got a couple, couple things to talk about here, real quick, um, as we get into this. Oh, we had a, a team reswizzle. So we'll talk about these in, in just a minute here. But um, basically, uh, a team kind of got exploded into smaller, more focused teams. Is that the right word for it, Brent? Uh, Let's call them mission specific. Mission specific. Mm -hmm. There you go. So, and uh, Xanatos just basically got renamed. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we we also have a new Metasploit developer on our team, Matthew Kino, and that's a picture of him. Just kidding. That's not. A picture of him. <laughs> it actually could be a picture. It could. Be, it could. Yeah. You know. Who knows, right? It's a little cold where he's from. Too. It is. It's true. You know. You gotta stay warm. And just a reminder that uh, we talked about it some last week and showed a little bit, uh, but the Metasploit.com has a fresh new look. So if you haven't caught it yet, uh, head over there and check it out. It's good stuff. Um, some stats. Uh, if you head over to the Metasploit.com, new refreshed website, you'll see you, there's a link uh, for contributor info and uh, GitHub has this nice uh, formatting. Uh, so here's just uh, the top contributors over the last three months. Uh, big ups to folks for helping make Metasploit awesome. And Did you want to talk about that? No. no. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about some things that landed. Uh, we have some uh, remote code execution uh, modules. Uh, some tar one targeting Unitrans Enterprise backup appliances. I think there were two vulnerable versions there. Mm -hmm. And then um, a Netgear, uh, I guess it's a router? Uh, that DGN yeah, that's, like a, that's a DSL router. Nice. Well. Yeah. yeah. Right on. We have about four or five of those in the lab too. They're all exploitable. That's great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> big success. Excellent. Uh, Hoodie hooked us up with the Gopher protocol scanner. That's landed, so y'all have at it. That's uh, that's a pretty cool one. I like that one. <laughs> Brought back memories of college. Um, we also had some improved uh, generated SSL certs thanks to our Whitcroft. Yeah, you get that right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which is awesome. So so now, um, uh, um, what is it? Um, McAfee, I believe, no longer detects Metasploit over reverse HTTPS out of the box. Of right. course, it's always better to create your own search if you want to use, um, you know, uh, Let's Encrypt or something like that. Um, but uh, but now out of the box, Metasploit still doesn't get detected by. Oh, it's semantic endpoint protection. Oh, okay. But yeah. it's simply using our malform search to to fingerprint when it was interpreted. Or not. <laughs> so so take this semantic endpoint protection. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We had a nice FTP client download fix uh, go in that um, allows you to download files larger than 16K. I uh, don't know how long that's been sitting around, but that's a nice fix. Well, it's, it's actually a, a prelude to some um, some exploits for mainframes, and uh, we need to be able to download more code than 16K to do the second bit. Uh, Big and Smalls is working on the, the second piece now. Right on. Nice. Um, uh, Will Vu hooked us up with some, some improved session script option uh, functionality, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So for the longest time, we've been saying that interpreter scripts are deprecated and you should use post exploitation modules instead. But we didn't provide an easy way to just run them. Um, you had to sort of run a interpreter script in between uh, the post exploitation module and, um, <laughs> and, and your session. And now you can actually run them all directly. Um, so now the, the I believe the dash s option, which is for script, yeah, yeah. can either point to an, a resource script, it can point to a interpreter script, or it can point to um, a post exploitation module directly. Very so cool. Really easy to use. Nice. All about the usability. Mm -hmm. um, we had crypto cryptelia support uh, in aggregator, uh, maybe a second time. I don't know, but it's there. You know, first time. This is the this is the first time. Yeah. Um, so we, we added crypto. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, we added crypto v support. We immediately broke aggregator. Um, right. I remember that. Now, part, now it, it kind of turns <laughs> off the TL, the crypt the cri encryption support. So that means we'll probably need to break aggregator one more time. Um, but for now, it works. Um, enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. Um, we have a slimmer, more svelte metal. Yes. That's right. Yeah. It turns out that on the x86 64 bit architecture, um, it required a one megabyte, or at least by default, it didn't require, but it, it suggested a one megabyte gap between uh, different sections inside an executable. 
And whenever we would uh, transmit the binary image, it meant that we sent three megabytes, of which almost two and a half megabytes was all zeros. Um, so uh, uh, one of our contributors actually found that out and said, hey, what if we change the page size to 4K? And then suddenly now it's 800 kilobytes in size. So nice. when we stage it, it's, it's about the same size as the binary. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad to have that one. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some support for uh, an embedded uh, processor that we found like in a printer of perhaps? That's right, yeah. Um, so Daryl Highland, one of our embedded researchers, has had this big honking Xerox printer in his office for a long time and um, he's had shells on it and I've always wanted to get Metasploit able to exploit against that printer but we didn't have support for the, the kind of rather oddball PowerPC variant that it had built into it um, and I've actually had a few different people ask me the same thing because they want to exploit other embedded devices and so this adds basically support for IBM's embedded PowerPC architecture, which is found in a lot of networking gear. Um, the Core IQ processor, mm -hmm. um, which you might have heard about from network processing land, um, oh, yeah. also uses the same architecture. Oh, so now we'll be able to exploit a lot more PowerPC based routers, printers, switches, whatever you have. Yay. Yeah. Very cool. And that's fresh. That's that's a hot new land, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like 30 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Hot off the presses. Uh, things in the works. Uh, we have Windows local pri privilege escalation. Um, we got some, some more RCE exploit modules coming down the pipe there. Um, um, interpreter uh, resource script support for Ruby directives. Uh, Zero Steiner, uh, I think, dropped that one in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's 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 getting ready there. Get, they to run Ruby stuff right from the resource script from interpreter. Uh, the metal extension loader. The framework PR is up. The payload PR will be up today, um, so that should be in the landed um, soon. Um, Printer exploits. All right, so uh, so in the sort of the theme of printer exploits, uh, Todd Beardsley has has always been asking me about, um, hey, can you guys exploit some multifunction printers because those are everywhere and no one ever patches them. So I went down to um, Office Depot near my house and just picked myself up uh, an HP for a hundred bucks and uh, got a reverse shell on it. So. Um, <laughs> Going to be working on getting that as a Metasploit module soon, maybe in addition to, to Daryl's uh, Xerox uh, printer stuff. And so, so hopefully we'll have at least a few dozen printers that will be exploitable right for Metasploit. Nice. How about death to the Metas module cache? Oh, I don't uh, want to steal someone else's thing. But, uh, <laughs> if you've ever started up Metasploit, it says, using slow search, that may soon be a relic of the past. Oh, all right, stay tuned. Uh, in the Metasploit 4 stable branch. Yeah, we're going to be working on basically creating a Metasploit 4 stable branch, as the name implies. The idea here is, um, and it's something we've been talking about for a while, is we want to start working on a Metasploit 5, um, effectively create a development branch so we can kind of, you know, maybe break a little bit of backwards compatibility on purpose and um, and try to figure out some, some of the things that we need to keep, some things we want to leave behind. And so uh, one of the things to start with is we're going to be creating a Metasploit 4 stable branch in GitHub. Um, what that basically means is that if you want to stick with Metasploit exactly as it is, um, that will be the place to, to be. Um, we'll be communicating with uh, Kali and all of our upstream consumers as well that they want to keep <laughs> practicing Metasploit 4, that'll be fine. Um, if you want to stay on the bleeding edge, uh, head will basically, or the, the, the master branch will basically become the new development branch and there'll probably be a lot more interesting stuff going into there soon. Cool. Yeah, good deal. All right. Well, let's get to the group group uh, team updates, I should say. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first team out of the gate is the Dharma Initiative, and this is security research and exploitation focused. Will? Will's not here. Adam's here. I can go. You want to talk about the talking points, Adam? Tell us about your team. Uh, yeah. Namaste. Uh, we are focused on developing modules, uh, maybe changing how modules run in the future. Uh, focusing more on separating modules out as standalone usable programs aside from MSF console and MSF console will just be the thing that runs them and configures them. Um, and that includes improving proxy support uh, and writing all sorts of cool exploits that we were sort of prevented from making their best in Ruby uh, with support from like all the Python libraries that are really nice. Nice. So, excellent. So that'll, that'll be mostly the module focus team. Right on. Very cool. All right. Next one is the script kitties. Now this one is, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Lo I love the, the graphic there. Uh, payloads and post exploitation. Brendan, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, we've kind of been split off, Jeffrey and I, uh, to play around with the payloads inside Interpreter to make sure, number one, that we're tracking the payloads that are inside Interpreter, making sure all of them still work. 
keeping them updated, adding them as they need to be added, um, and kind of moving forward for all of the fun stuff there. Did you want to talk about aggregator? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we've discussed it before. The aggregator is, is, is about separating out some of that communication um, and, and just standardizing what's going on as we communicate from a payload back to the console. Um, and so the as it evolves, the aggregator will become more of a, a more, more of a, a boundary where we're going to get the, inter the interface to communicate a little bit more uh, more standardized um, and be able to just keep good separation between the things that are happening in a payload and things that are happening in the console. Right on. Very cool. Uh, we also have Abnormal Forum, and these this team is our uh, data model and architecture team. Uh, Chris, you want to speak a little bit about that? Or? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you just fine. Um, sure. Um, so uh, our team is primarily focused on the what's known as the Goliath project, which is essentially building this, this data, this really nice data service tier for Metasploit and fixing the current abstractions as they exist. Um, that's pretty much it. Very cool. Hello. Love the name. And let's see. Last, last, uh, but not least, of the new team team nomenclatures is the Flatlanders, uh, which was formerly Xanatos. And so this one's we're focused on uh, Dev and I on the network protocols and scalability uh, kind of things. Uh, like lately, that's been Ruby SMB, and this cycle around has been it's the commercial release. But um, yeah, look for us for network protocols and scalability going forward. Nice. Yeah. It's time for demos, and yeah, we did have there was some there was some pumpkin cutting uh, last night. If you want to see the jack o' lantern this came out of, um, there'll be should be a pop up link on the uh, YouTube video right about now. Uh, so just click that, and you can you can see the rest of the pumpkin that got massacred. Awesome. <laughs> and with that, uh, Chris, you wanna you wanna lead us off? Do I make you presenter? Sure, 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 absolutely. Awesome. I might, I might have to plug it just one screen. Let me see here. Okay. Well, it should should have a pop up. Uh, I don't know if I try to share just one screen. I guess I have to share the entire thing. Oh man, you did this last time, and it was like this really narrow, long thing. I remember this now. I'm having a flashback. <laughs> oh, we'll see. We'll see how this turns out. That's yeah. Really was, like, oh oh man, I remember this. Now this is this is this is totally good. This, this looks good, okay. Chris. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, forgot hey, can you see? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's bad. Yeah. That's good. Okay, because because I, I can't see. But anyway, to, to 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 give some context as to what I'm doing, it's not really to kill the module cache. It's to remove the database version, database backed version of the module cache. And and the reason we want to do this is, uh, as you know, we're working on uh, creating this new data service, and uh, porting the database version of the module cache is uh, is a little, would be a little hairy. If anyone has ever worked in the module cache layer, you you, you know that code's very complex. And uh, a secondary reason is that there's no reason why searching should really be taking 15 seconds without the database. That's why I think most people just use grip, I guess. Um, so th those, th th that's, that's the reason why I, I kind of wanted to fix this problem, uh, mostly for the for Goliath secondary is to fix the, the current search issue. Um, so the, the first approach was to, I wondered why, why we don't, for the reason search takes so long in the first place is because when every time we search, it uh, loads all instances of modules in memory and then does a search. And that takes on my box around 15 to 20 seconds each time, um, which is a little bit unacceptable. And so I thought to myself, hey, so why don't we just load all this in memory all at once and keep it? But it turns out that the uh, memory usage for, for this uh, is, is, is around an extra 100 meg, which I, which I guess is the reason why it wasn't uh, done before. So I, uh, another approach I took was maybe we don't need all these instances in memory to, to do a search. And so I created a, 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 meta, a metadata class storage for, for modules. Um, that turned out to work pretty good uh, because the, the memory difference is only about uh, five to seven megs more, maybe. And so I thought that that would be acceptable if we could do that. And then the problem that happened after that is that um, for me to load this initially on startup, it took uh, Metasploit, the console, an extra uh, 15 seconds to load. So I went from seven seconds to 20 seconds to start a console. So to fix that problem, I, I waited until the, um, until the console starts and then trickle loaded the, um, the modules in. Um, so the only problem you'd ever have with this new uh, approach is if you loaded Metasploit immediately to do some kind of searching. 
and I'll demo that real quick. It's not, not a very exciting demo, but um, so I'll start my flight. Database. And this usually takes about seven seconds without um, without the, the, the caching loaded immediately. So it loads quickly. That's good. But if you do a search immediately for something like uh, Bitcoin, it's loading right now. So right now it's waiting to, to, to cache the um, rest of the data. This takes about maybe five seconds, four or five to six seconds. We'll see. Yeah, so that took a little longer, but immediately, but once that's done, um, anytime you do searching from here on out, it's it's within milliseconds. And I think that satisfies, satisfies um, hopefully satisfies the um, what we're trying to achieve here. And now I can probably remove um, the rest of the DB module cache if people think this is like an acceptable approach. So this is kind of to help hopefully solicit some um, information, so solicit feedback for what I'm working on. So there you have it. That's the new search approach that I have uh, hopefully solved. Well, that's really good. I, I think that's actually faster than pros, like initial loading of the middle <coughs> page, which pretty much is yeah. the same thing. So um, that, that's very, very good. Really Thanks. Good. Can, can we take this to like Twitter and to uh, Facebook with our demo and, and solicit feedback? We can put up a PR and solicit feedback, certainly. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Uh, I gotta have already to go anytime sometime soon. Cool. All right. Um, and on the same note of abnormal form, uh, you, uh, James, you uh, had something you wanted to yeah. show related to loot. The loot, the loot, the loot is on fire. Maybe not. All right. So <laughs> let's see. All right. You should have an option to present. Um, that looks like my screen. Is that all good? Everybody seeing everything correctly? Uh, if it is a terminal window, yes. yeah, yeah, looks good. I'm gonna make it a little bigger. Thank you. There you go. Um, I'm gonna catch up. Oh, okay. So uh, first thing I'm doing is uh, just a little setup. What I'm gonna show is um, some work with Goliath. I basically have been working on porting uh, more data models over to. Um, uh, use a to be able to use a remote data store um, and kind of taking out the active record crap in between and making it a little more um, uh, abstract and uh, portable. Um, so what I've got going on right here, this is just a, a um, RC script that I wrote that's just going to pop a shell, a root shell on Metasploitable. And uh, it's going to, I'm going to show um, collecting loot from this and storing it on a remote data store instead of just in a local database. So um, while that's running, I'll just uh, do my little magician thing and show that there's nothing in my hat. Um, this is the remote data store. Uh, there's currently nothing. I'm looking at the loot. Um, it's running on this VM right here. If I look in the loot directory, I've got nothing. So, um, okay, I've got my root shell. Let me just make sure. Um, oh my God. Um, sorry, I have a brain fart. All right, so this session right here is running as root. Um, so I'm going to just use a uh, post module for gathering Linux hash, hash dumps. Um, set my session to use the root session so I can gather this stuff. And then I'm just going to run it. It got all of the uh, loot. So if I run loot here, I can see all of the files that I've gathered. Um, oh, it's not updating. It's there it goes. Really oh, okay, sorry, I'll slow down. Yeah. Oh, silence is freaking out. That's why. <laughs> uh, and then if I look at the, uh, this is the remote data store here at all. Here's everything stored in JSON. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's all accessible to anybody who would be um, connected to this data store. And the actual files are stored on the remote system as well. So I can just um, load up one of those files. And um, what is it, hashes? Analytics. 
And there we go, we've got our files stored on the remote system. So this will be really nice moving forward. If you know, you've got multiple people working on the same pen test, you can all be doing different things, throw the data into a common data store and use it and um, use it collaboratively instead of just having everything stored locally in your own little world. Is this backed by the Postgres database or is it a file-based? Uh, yeah, right now the, the Postgres database is running on the um, on the remote system, okay. um, so it's it's basically just porting that over to whatever system you want to run it on. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah, so and and this is just password hashes and stuff. But like, if you had other loot files, like I don't know if you collected binary files or something like that, it, it sends all those too. So basically, just base sixty uh, we base sixty four the file, send it over as JSON, and then decode it on the receiving end. And um, so far, it's worked pretty well for even larger files. So, is there encryption that goes between the Metasploit console that it's collecting the loot and the remote data store? No, we it's only HTTP right now, but uh, we are that is in the pipeline to get HTTPS support added. So, what's next? What's next? I'm working on um, porting over the DBN map command to uh, have that. Um, Whenever you run DBN map, it will store the posts and all the uh, nmap data in the remote data store instead of just locally. Okay. So uh, it's going to use this. It's using the same uh, principle. It's just instead of taking, you know, decoding the uh, uh, or parsing the um, nmap XML file locally, it's just going to send it up to the remote data store, parse it there, and then store everything needed. Yeah. So I was just thinking, like, if we really wanted to push early enough in on this airport, we should probably think about doing the encryption such that we can just push a whole, hey, loot now can be done remotely, even when DBN map cannot okay. be done yet. Yeah. Uh, but we could actually push some of this stuff uh, and have people use it. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm not too far in the deep. Well, I'm actually really close to having it done. So I'll finish that up and then yeah. take a look at the HTTPS. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, like, let's, let's think about how we can get people to use this and give us feedback okay. as soon as possible. Um, gotcha. That's that's perhaps the best way to validate that this is something that we can use. Yeah, I gotcha. Awesome. Very cool. Thanks, James. Mm -hmm. Brendan, did you want to show us some payload testing? Did you want to also talk about baseline build here, Ronald? Um, no, we we discussed that. Okay, then mm -hmm. each one will steal your thunder. Excellent. Okay, so it should be bothering me. I'm unbothered. You are unbothered. I said, I said, Brendan, you're Brendan, right? Oh, did you know? Yeah. Huh. Are you on the right screen? <laughs> and you're, you have multiple desktops, maybe? It's popped up on a different one. Did you show up? Do you have an alias? I don't see anybody else on. There we go. Okay. Hey, this is what he gets for using Windows. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Punishment. Burn. <laughs> A lot of extra money. Um, <laughs> uh, so some people may have seen uh, some, some pictures like this inside uh, PRs mm -hmm. or uh, automated testing. I've presented one time on automated testing before, but uh, it was, I guess, probably at least uh, two months ago, and I did it pretty quickly. Uh, I wanted to kind of go through and, and give expectations and realities for this particular product and the directions it's going. Uh, I will demo this, though it's not exactly the most exciting thing to see. You enter a command and then you wait about 15 to 20 minutes and you get a result, uh, mostly like this. But I did want to talk a little bit about what, uh, what was involved and what's going on in the background and other stuff. Um, so this started out as all right. This started out as payload testing, which was, uh, I got asked, hey, why don't you send something that will test payloads? So throughout this entire project, I have probably has felt the single greatest failure of opening this up wider than I probably needed to be. And that has unfortunately made it complicated, though it doesn't just test payloads anymore. Um, it, uh, it works by creating... Uh, either bash files or Python scripts, then interacting with VMs that are on ESXi or other virtualization type providers, starting them, placing the files in there, running them, so it essentially mocks up exactly a MSF console 
you know, the exercise. Uh, we're going to hopefully get past the ESXi. Uh, so anybody that's following uh, VM automation will notice that Pierce has given a PR for support of more free stuff. And hopefully we'll get to land that real quick and we'll start supporting other stuff than ESXi. Um, under covers, basically, you, there we go. So you mean virtual box? Is that what it's yep. called? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to try and do some free stuff because that's the right price. Yeah. Uh, underneath the covers, uh, essentially there's three stages. You have MSF hosts that are the host that are the VMs that run MSF console. You've got targets which run payloads. Uh, the easiest way to talk about it is to separate into three stages. The stage one is create all the payloads. Stage two is upload the payloads and run them on the targets. And stage three is launch blind handlers if we need to call back into the payloads. Uh, then what, what, is, what is success? Uh, success is determined by recording the entire session that takes place through Meterpreter and then checking to see if we have a match on something. Uh, Right now, for the default, what I do is I'll upload uh, post-test interpreter and post-test railgun and run through both of those, verify that I actually get the output from both of those commands that we want to verify that interpreter is up there and that railgun is functioning. Um, and if that comes back, then it's success. Um, now, earlier I talked about the fact that perhaps payload testing wasn't exactly the way to do it because currently we can now test almost anything that you can script in Metasploit. So we, uh, I've pushed out exploit tests, I've pushed out scanner tests for aux modules, uh, we've done privilege escalation tests uh, for a lot of the bypass UAC stuff that has come out. Uh, it, it's, when I called it payload test, I didn't realize we were gonna take it quite as far as we have, so. Hey, you know what? This is really interesting. I think there's an opportunity here to try to talk to the science engineers lab guys because mm -hmm. they are trying to find ways to test IDR. Okay. And uh, if we have an automated sure. way to just fire all of these things and, you know, they can see if IDR works. <laughs> I can launch a lot of attacks in a network. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, that... That's yeah, we have someone who's basically trying to do exactly what you've already done. Oh, and okay. So if you can just stick an IDR in the middle of it, it pretty much solves a bit, another big problem. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they're asking for it, so I I'll, we'll contact you with the right person that's sitting up there. Okay. Uh, just to kind of go over some of the things that we've played with, uh, in, in addition to supporting VMs, so some old VMs you can't get VMware tools on anymore. So, you know, Windows 2000, you're not going to find VMware tools on. Um, and so we can't do some of the fun magic stuff. The great thing is, is basically you hit a command, it sets up all the VMs, puts them where they need to be, runs everything, and then returns the VMs back to their original uh, snapshots. You can't do that with uh, stuff that, some of the stuff. Uh, for the VMware tools, it's great because I don't have to have an exploit that works. It'll take the payload, it'll upload the payload and run it. Um, and then we don't have to worry about having a, an exploit that works. So VM, VMs with tools, I can pretty much support, you know, automated power on, power off, payload execution, return to good state, and uh, use those as exploit targets. But they'll also support VMs that don't have tools and physical devices now. So I have a, I have a uh, embedded device range in my closet right now back home, and uh, I can run against uh, Linksys routers. I've got ARM uh, chips in there, and I've been testing against embedded devices, too. Um, we need that closer here, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, a good question is, what on our, what payloads are supported? Well, we have something like four hundred and eighty-six payloads now. Five hundred and three. Five hundred and three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, right now I've only tested it with Meterpreter, but there's nothing that says you can't support shell payloads right now either. Um, so. Right now, I can say I haven't tested PHP because none of my targets have PHP installed. Otherwise, it would probably work. Uh, right now, the system does not support IPv6 yet. There is a PR that's waiting for us to start supporting IPv6, and then we'll start to be able to test the IPv6 stuff. I have no Mac stuff right now because I don't have Macs. Uh, I'm working on that currently. Um, we should probably send you with one of the laptops that were, you know, yeah. already, in, already in there. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> already working with Sebastian. Um, and so, uh, 
hopefully I'll have Mac stuff soon. Uh, IPv6 will be coming. Um, and so what has changed since we last talked? I fixed, there were a bunch of issues with synchronization between those three stages. Uh, those have gotten better. They, I'm getting a very few false positives now. Um, brought back support for Linux. So we now support uh, Linux VMs to test Linux payloads. Uh, we've uh, support VMs without tools, support for SSH interpreters. So basically there's a, for a device like a, an ARM chip, if we have SSH running on it, we can go ahead and use that SS, uh, SSH to interpreter module to convert it to a interpreter session and test our payloads, even if we don't have a uh, necessarily uh, good exploit to get on. Oh, way. and you know what? I, I totally, we totally forgot to mention something really important that uh, came up this, this, this sprint as well, and that uh, the uh, Shelf interpreter mm -hmm. uh, module now works with interpreter as well. So you can actually upgrade a shell or script-based interpreter to a native interpreter. And it was really a matter of just deleting the code that made it not work. <laughs> it was a, a net negative to create a net positive. There you go. Uh, nice. We, uh, I increased uh, logging, and uh, Jeffrey uh, was happy to pick up, point out a bunch of stupid things that I had done. Um, so I fixed those. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I'm, we're working with right now is automating the automation. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Command line options got added. Uh, one of the things that has happened is this was originally planned to be something that was scheduled to take place, but more and more as it took longer to develop, I found myself all of a sudden writing up a random test file to test some particular thing, and that kind of got to a pain that every time I wanted to test something, I created a new test file. Every time I wanted a different payload, I had to copy that whole file, then just change the payload in it. Uh, recently, we have, we've added command line options so that I can say this test, but I want it to be done with this payload, go. Uh, and it's kind of nice that way. We'll, I'll show you, we'll see that in a second. Uh, and so now we're kind of moving to the path of supporting both. Uh, so we'll be able to schedule things and if somebody needs to test something really quick, they can just fire up a one a quick test without having to create their own files. So command line options. The only thing you really have to have is a JSON test file that I talked about the first time that we, we brought this up. Um, but also now you can say tag F and give it the framework branch that you want. So say, oh, I'm working on this. I have this particular branch that's up in my repo. Oh, that's nice. uh, as long as it's public facing, you can just hand that framework branch in and that'll be the target of the test. Uh, when you say means, public facing, you mean you have to have committed that branch. Yep. Yeah. And it has to be a public. You kind of yeah. have it in the yeah. local. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the way this functions, <laughs> it actually executes the test on another system, and that system has to be able to pull it down. Pull it down. Okay, that makes sense. Um, you can change the module that you want to run against, if you want it to be an exploit or if you want an aux module. You can give it a new payload, and you can feed it uh, new payload options if you want. So in the, if you wanted to say, perhaps use uh, reverse TCP RC4, you can then say pass RC4 password is equal to blah. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are in MSF Venom style. Mm -hmm. It matches. Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of the issues we've run into in the direction we're going on. Uh, so this is kind of processor intensive, but I really have no idea how best to make spinning up 30 Windows VMs not be somewhat processor intensive. Um, there's really no solution there. So we're we're hitting the, the edge of some of the servers that we're working with right now, and that's kind of fun. Um, truthfully, the, the predicted use cases that I had are not the ones that are coming true, which is probably true for any longer running project. Um, unfortunately, this is I, I've kept a lot of the use cases, but it has created sometimes a confusing way to move forward for somebody that's just getting into this. So I need to write some decent documentation and tell people to just ignore some of the features that are really handy for edge cases that we can still use later. Um, and it relies on ESXi either paid or trial, and the range of VMs have to be set up. But as Jeffrey has talked about before, the baseline builder is a wonderful thing in that uh, essentially if you give me a piece of hardware now, we can use baseline builder, install ESXi with a trial license, and within about eight hours, have 23 Windows VMs that are ready for this testing to take place on. Um, and that's that's kind of awesome. 
given the fact that I think the first range that I built for this took me the better part of three, four days just to get it off the ground. So, so that was really awesome. Is there any? I don't know if this is this hard at all, but if it takes those twenty minutes to actually get through a response for one of the use cases, and if you really want to test the whole thing, I guess how often do you test the whole thing, the whole set of payloads in all of those different systems? So, is that a bit, is that an artifact of building? So, 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 let me let me add to this a little bit. So the, the idea, what we're actually doing is we're having uh, our Jenkins infrastructure auditing this, right? And the idea long term is that uh, a contributor can create their own tests, verify their test, and provide it in the PR. When the PR hits, we will have actually ha uh, put in GitHub hooks that are actually going to. One run that test, mm -hmm. but also we're going to place it in, uh, in in a structure similar to the way we do payloads and modules as it is, mm -hmm. and we expect to be able to test at least the, the next level up all tests that run with that, that exist within that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So if you gave me a test that mod that modifies interpreter x sixty four reverse TCP, then I will run all interpreter x sixty four payloads plus all interpreter 32-bit payloads mm -hmm. as a test and provide and then take the output and put land it right back against your get your your PR and say hey these things work these things fail if you if you see validation if you see an incorrect validation there or if they see something that in and of itself could be a canary to us that hey something else failed because of some other PR that came through that didn't have that <laughs> associated to it things like that and then separately running something like a bi-weekly test that actually runs through all of the th all, all of the test files that we have. Right, okay. So is there any opportunity for parallelization? I guess that's what I was trying to go to, like having a different uh, ESXi server or a cluster or server that allows you to parallelize those really every single You can, you you, yeah. you can. You can use the chink you could use you can use the infrastructure that actually is starting the test to simply have it point to a round robin set of Infrastructure. We're also looking at adding uh, one of the. We actually just added an issue on the baseline builder code for doing this to add an ability to prepend um, to the uh, VM names, so that you can actually have multiple VMs that are being generated by the baseline builder that are independent sets um, on their own schedules, and so you can create 23 VMs, and then a copy of those 23 VMs, and another copy of those 23 VMs that are all in the same infrastructure, and be able to then run. Uh, run against each of those independent sets. Mm -hmm. We actually have a couple other demos to try to get in, so I'm not just yeah. apply okay. a little bit of pressure. That's awesome. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. This is fantastic. No, it's really so, good. Three more minutes? All right. Well, not really. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long Brent's is going to oh, be. So. That's fine. Yeah. Mine, mine, mine will be basically two minutes. Okay. And then Insight Fish, mm -hmm. which have, they have two. So. Okay. Another time we can talk about the, the troubleshooting stuff. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That's very good stuff. Leo's very excited. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brent, I'm just hand it over to you. Oh, sure. My, okay. I, I don't have a whole lot to say, but I, hopefully it'll be very meaningful. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> Show my screen. Main screen turn on. All right, so imagine you're watching one of those cheesy infomercials at night where someone <coughs> no one is basically failing in life in some way. Have, have you ever yeah. generated a payload? <laughs> <laughs> Payloads are too messy. Um, there's too many ways to fail. So, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually generate a payload, uh, re reverse TCP SSL, and um, uh, start a mess exploit over here. And so I've got a listener here on the left-hand side. I've got a payload I just generated. And uh, if I was uh, doing the infomercial, infomercial voice, I would say, have you ever gotten a session with Metasploit? Then you go to interact with it. Uh, well, actually, first you type it right, and you go to interact with it, and it doesn't work. Ah, it's so frustrating. Why isn't this working? Well, Brent, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. <laughs> there, there is. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, it turns out if you just fix the code, um, it, it actually works. So, uh, so digging into this, this is something that actually that the, the payload testing that, that Brendan was just talking about um, found, identified. Because uh, who, whoever uses Python reverse TCP SSL? Obviously, no one in the last year, otherwise they would have complained about it. But thanks to the baseline tester, um, we were able to actually identify that it was broken for a while, for maybe about a month or so. And, um, and that was actually caused by a, 
um, some of the other PRs we did that didn't seem like they touched it, but they really did. Um, and actually, I found a really interesting bug in Metasploit's core code. You can see here, this is the receive function inside of the depths of the interpreter packet parsing code. So an interesting thing about this, if you look to the left-hand side, you can see that uh, the very first thing it does is, is check to see, is, are there any bytes required by the packet parser? And if there are some bytes required, then we'll try to read from the incoming socket and add them to the packet. And then hopefully it will read, have read enough bytes in that one instance to have basically process the packet. However, there was upstream code that if it didn't get a packet back, it basically just quit. Um, so that means basically if all the bytes weren't available immediately, um, Metasploit would stop processing all the packets for a session, which meant that the session wasn't dead, and it, although Metasploit, of course, thinks it's dead because it basically gives up if, if, if you don't have at least like 64 bytes available. In this case, when we had SSL turned on, we only had 32 bytes available in the very first read, so it caused this, this loop to exit too quickly, and basically it meant if you had any sort of low high latency or any kind of situation where your packets weren't exactly aligned just right, um, you would fail very badly, and you would get this sort of fake session come up. Um, so basically what this PR does here, and I'm sorry, I keep switching back and forth, um, is it adds a loop <laughs> that keeps reading from the socket until actually all the bytes are available or the socket disconnects. And if socket disconnects, then it fails and you get a nice disconnected session. But if there's more data to be read, it will basically keep reading until there's actually a, a packet available and it will make everything work, even in high latency situations. So let's go ahead and check out the the working version. Um, we'll go ahead and fix the, this guy. Now this isn't landed yet, we're, we're testing it, but I got a good feeling that um, this is going to be get got, get checkout, fix partial packets. All right, we're gonna start this guy up again. And start up our session. Oh, I'm regenerating the packet. I didn't mean to do that. No worries. Python. And now we have a working system, though, even though the packets were chopped up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So good news all around. Hopefully yeah. this will actually solve a lot of weird, mysterious, <laughs> it works for me, but not for me kind of situations with Metasploit and sessions that don't seem to work. Absolutely. So that's it. And that's Very exactly nice. the bug we were running. I was running into the with the aggregator that we just punted on and moved around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I, I, I'm hoping that, that more people can go, hey, that was the bug I was having. Let me yeah, check it out. Yeah, and yeah. Say that they, they the more the merrier. So anyway, awesome. hopefully it's a good thing. Thank you, Brent.